Good morning. It's good to have Deacon Rich back by my side. I was deaconless the last two weekends, and I, I was telling him, I'm like, I just feel lost without having a deacon sidekick. And it was really good this morning because we sat down for the first reading, and I leaned over to him. I said, it is really hot in here. And he goes, I just turned the air conditioning up. <laughs> so if you start freezing, I don't care. I'm, wear- I'm the one wearing the vestments. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's dive in. So in the first reading we have from the prophet Isaiah, we hear the Lord, we hear the Lord's heart, right? We hear the Lord's heart. He says this, I come to gather the nations of every language, and they shall come and see my glory. All right, here's some more. In the Gospels from uh, the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus say, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one, there will be one flock, one shepherd, where Jesus says that he's the good shepherd and he isn't content to have just 99 sheep, that the lost sheep he wants to go find and bring him in. He says, I want all of them, right? He goes after the lost. 99% in my world was an A plus every day of the week, right? But it wasn't enough for him. He wants 100%. He says in the Gospels, I came to seek and to save the lost. He says, the healthy have no need of a physician. It's the sick who do. I came for the sick. I came for sinners. He gives that parable of the wedding feast. He tells the servants, go out to the highways, the hedgerows, the byways. Bring everyone in. Invite them all. Come into the feast. He says this, my hall, it must be filled to overflowing. Right? That's his heart. That's his heart. Do you hear his heart? Do you hear his heart? Do you hear the Father's heart? This longing for everyone to be invited in. This longing to gather in everybody and every person from every land to draw everyone into the orbit of his love and beauty and goodness. He wants no one excluded. He doesn't want anyone left out. He wants all gathered in. That's the point. And this is why, this is why he sends the son. This is why he sends his son for this purpose, to effect the rescue and ransom and retrieval of the lost human race, to bring us back These rebel sons and daughters, these captives, he wanted us back. So he sends the son to save us, to restore us, to bring us in. That's what his name means, right? That's what Jesus, Yeshua, means after all. God saves. That's what his name means. But here's the question, right? Do we really all need saving? I mean, isn't it the case that we've come to believe in our modern Christian church, maybe not in the Catholic church, but modern Christian church, wider sort of Christian sensibility? Haven't we come to this place where doesn't that, like that whole being saved business, doesn't that just happen for everybody, right? Haven't we gotten to this place where everyone is saved these days? Isn't that what we think? I mean, do we really believe in a God who creates people, and then is willing to let those same people be condemned to hellfire and wailing and grinding of teeth. Grinding of teeth, right? Deacon's a dentist, right? There's no mouth guards available in hell. So, do we really believe that, though? Do we really believe that we have a God who creates people and is willing to let them be condemned and lost and separated for eternity? Haven't we matured to a different understanding that all are basically saved? Like, you really got to be like a Hitler, to go to hell. Like this doctrine, this doctrine of hell, this idea that the door could be closed upon you and you'll be left on the outside looking in, knocking, and Jesus would say, depart from me, you evildoers. This doctrine of hell, like look, I get it. It's a horrible doctrine. I get why all throughout the history of the church there's been this tendency, this gravitational pull, if you will, there's been this proclivity towards this idea known as universalism that says effectively, in the end, all are saved, that hell is empty. It's the the Greek word is apocatastasis, that in the end, in the apocalypse, everything will be brought back to a state of completion, right? And friends, like in total transparency, there is a part of my heart that like wishes that was true, that wishes it was true, but the truth is it just isn't so. That's not to say that hell's jam-packed. I'm not saying that. We don't know. We don't know. The church has never said definitively who is or who isn't in hell. 
Right? We know that there's canonized saints. We've got saints in heaven, but we've never declared, oh, that's a, that's a canonized damned person. Like, we don't have that. We don't have that category. But it's possible to go there. It's absolutely possible. And what we do know about hell, we know most of all from the lips of the Lord. Like in the gospel we have today where Jesus says in response to someone who asked the question, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He answers them. Notice how he doesn't give a number. He doesn't give a stat. He doesn't give a percentage. He makes it personal. He says, strive. You strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. Now, what does the word many mean for the God of the universe? I mean, one sheep lost was one too many. I don't know. He doesn't say, which means it's not for us to know, but it's for us to know that it is possible. And it seems as though many will attempt to enter but will not be strong enough. Wide, he says, why is the way that leads to perdition and narrow is the gate that leads to salvation and few that are that enter through the narrow gate? And why, why is the gate narrow? That's an important question. Why is the gate narrow? It's not because the Lord deliberately wants to limit the number of souls getting into heaven. It's not like a, like a, like a stadium turnstile that all the crowds are coming in and it's like you funnel through this very narrow gate. That's not why it's narrow. It's narrow because it's particular, it's specific. The gate is in the shape of Jesus, if you will. It's in the shape of Christ crucified. It, like we have to sound like Jesus. We gotta look like Jesus. We gotta love like Jesus. We gotta forgive like Jesus. We gotta be merciful like Jesus. We have to put on, as St. Paul says, the mind of Christ. We have to be transformed. Like every part of us has to become by his grace partakers of his nature. We've gotta become bearers of his image. Fulton Sheen put it this way, that when we stand before the Father, he's going to look at us and he's going to be looking for the marks of his Son. He's going to say, let me see your hands. Are they marked with love? Let me see your side. Is it pierced and open from love? Let me see your feet. Are they marked and branded with love? Let me see your lips, your mouth, your mind. Is it marked with love? And all of that, this is accomplished in this life by his grace and through suffering and through conformity to the cross. And for those souls who die in that imperfect union with the Lord, then purgatory takes care of the rest. And friends, let's just, let's get this out of our heads now. Don't be banking on purgatory. If you aim for purgatory, you're probably going to fall short. Aim for glory. Aim for glory. Aim for glory. Amen? I've heard that from so many people. I, I'll just, I'll work it out in purgatory. Well, maybe. <laughs> and also, I promise that it's going to be a lot more painful there than it is now. So, friends, again, there's this urgency in the Lord's heart. He says, my heart, my house, it must be filled. I want to gather in all the nations. I do not desire the death of the sinner. I want the sinner to live. I want all the lost sheep to be found and be part of this fold. So, yes, we should absolutely have a missionary impulse in our hearts and a desire to share our faith, yes, because the consequences of not doing so are dramatic and dire and horrific. We should fear the loss of souls. We should fear the idea that anybody that we know or love that we see would somehow be lost to, to be on the outside of the door. But that is not the only reason why we should share our faith. That would we, that's what we would call imperfect contrition, right? It's, we must also, like, the desire to share the faith should also be coming forth from this place that says knowing Jesus is, quite simply, it's the pearl of great price. To know him, to love him, to share life with him is, it's the best way to be human. It's joy inexpressible. It's unbelievable bliss. It is glory indescribable. There's a banquet that we're inviting people into. It's not like, let's just avoid the scary place. We're inviting people to, to come to the feast. Come to the banquet. There is a banquet that corresponds to your heart. There's a fountain of living water that corresponds to your thirst, and his name is Jesus. But here's the question. Right? We sang it in the psalm. Go out to all the world and share the good news. How many of us, though, quite honestly, how many of us really, really feel equipped to share that aspect of our faith to go out, 
to invite? How many of us really feel equipped to evangelize? I mean, I dare say probably not many of us. And whose fault is that? It's not yours. It's ours. It's the hierarchy's fault. It's your priests, your bishops, your pastors. This is a failure of fatherhood in the church. That you don't feel equipped to do the mission of evangelization is the fault and the failure of fatherhood. We failed to father you well in this. And I'm not necessarily speaking of this parish. I'm not. I'm just saying that this is a global issue. It's a crisis of spiritual fatherhood. That somewhere along the line, priests and bishops and pastors forgot their mission. They forgot that, like, yeah, we go by a lot of titles, wear a lot of hats. Liturgical presider, um, semi-CEO of a big corporation, um, administrator, handler of finances, spiritual counselor. But at the end of the day, the way that the faithful address the priest is just simply as father. And I, somewhere along the line, that's gotten forgotten. It's the mission of the hierarchy to equip the faithful for the work. This is, I mean, this is biblical. This isn't my idea. This is St. Paul to the Ephesians. And he, the Lord, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. In other words, he's giving charisms to the, the, the bishops and priests. Why? For the equipping of the holy ones, y'all, for the work of ministry. For what end? For the building up of the body of Christ, evangelization. In other words, the biblical vision is that our job is to equip you to do your job, to do your role, the role of evangelization. Here's another quote. This is from um, Archbishop Vigneron. From, he's the Archbishop of Detroit. He wrote an incredible document. If you want something great to read this week, it's called Unleash the Gospel. Archdiocese of Detroit, Unleash the Gospel. This is, this is what he says. The special calling and privilege of the lay faithful is to bring Christ into the secular world. Since the laity, in accordance with their station in life, live in the midst of the world and its concerns, they are called by God to exercise their apostolate in the world like leaven. With the ardor of the Spirit of Christ, their role is to transform every aspect of the culture through the gospel. How much of the, how much of the culture? How much of the culture? Okay, just, just making sure we're listening. Their role is to transform every aspect of the culture through the gospel. Family life, education, government, business, the media, entertainment, sports, science, the arts. They do so, he says, both by engaging the temporal affairs and ordering them according to the plan of God and by revealing Christ by word to those around them. Revealing Christ by word to those around them. Many of us have probably heard that quote from St. Francis that's allegedly from St. Francis. Preach the gospel at all times when necessary. Use words. Raise your hand if you've heard this quote before. Okay. St. Francis never, ever, 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 ever said that. He didn't say it. It's nowhere in the histories of Franciscan literature. You know why he never said that? Because Francis couldn't shut up about Jesus. If people didn't listen to him, he was preaching to the birds and the squirrels and the animals. Like he could, this is a guy who was so convicted by the gospel, he went across the Muslim line to go talk to the sultan to convert the sultan. He's like, I'm just going to preach the gospel with my actions. No! He used his words. By revealing Christ by words to those around them. Why? Because souls are at stake. Like there really are people who are perishing. There really are people who are being lost. There really are people who like in your world, in your sphere of influence, there are people who are suffering under the tyranny of sin and hopelessness that they don't know Jesus. He's the only hope this world has and people don't know him. They don't know that there's another way to be. They don't know that their sins can be forgiven. They don't know that they can be transformed. They just don't know. And there really are people who are being lost. People don't know that life with Christ is better. That to be a human person, like we flourish in the measure that we're in relationship with him. 
but we feel so ill-equipped to do it. We feel so ill-equipped. What if they ask me something I don't know? I don't really feel like I know anything about the Bible. I don't really know what I would say about this, that, or the other thing, right? We feel so ill-equipped to step into this. So here's what the Lord put on my heart this week. This is what I feel he's calling me to do as one of your spiritual fathers, is to equip you and to empower you to do this. To equip you for mission. So here's two things, right? So the Becoming Catholic RCIA series that we have here at Sacred Heart, so far right now we've got I think four-ish, maybe five adults who are going to be, uh, gonna be on the journey with us and three young people? Three kids. Okay. Three teens, you said? Okay. Okay, friends, first of all, there's more than that that like, are out there. And they don't know about becoming Catholic here because we've not asked them. We, so first of all, the first invitation is this. We really want to like, like push you to be disciples, to go out and invite people to the banquet, to invite people in, to invite people to walk with us this year through this series. Like there is more that the Lord wants. The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So I'm calling out my laborers. We need you. We need you. Second thing is this, that Deacon Rich and Chris Serger, the leadership team for Becoming Catholic, we, we've talked about this, and what I want to do is I want to open up this, this series to the entire parish, right? So I'm going to be doing the majority of the teaching all year long Wednesday nights. I'm going to be doing most of the teaching. It's not just going to be for those becoming Catholic. It's, as Chris said, it's going to be for those who want to become better Catholic. So it's BC and BBC, okay? That's the plan this year. BC and BBC. I'm going to be teaching most of the classes, and the ones that I can't teach, Deacon Rich and Chris are going to be doing. So excellent, amazing teaching. Friends, at this point, like our relationship, your walk with me, you know my heart. You know how passionate I am about all this, and you got to know that for like every 20-minute homily I preach, there's about 30 other minutes of content that gets left on the cutting room floor every week, okay? So you get the short versions, all right? There is so much in my heart that I want to share, and I just don't have time to share it from the pulpit. I love our faith. It's so beautiful. It's so good. It's so interconnected. It makes sense. It's a symphony, and most of us just really haven't heard it. So I would love nothing more than for McMahon Hall on Wednesday nights to be packed, to be absolutely packed. You don't have to commit every Wednesday, but just come. Come to learn. Like, Come to study, come to find out more, to grow deeper. Like, I would love for it to be packed with those who are becoming Catholic and all of us who just want to become more intentional disciples. Let it be packed that we might be equipped for the mission. The Lord wants his world back, and Jesus wants all the sheep to be in the fold. And this is your mission as laity. It's the mission of evangelization. And, like, I don't want to keep asking you to do something that you don't know how to do or that you don't feel equipped to do. So I want to equip you to do it. So be looking on our parish's website, the homepage. We're going to have a whole separate um, section of the website. Where's Dan? There he is. Dan's going to create a whole section of the website. I'm telling him right now for the first time. Um, (laughs) He can handle it. We're going to have a whole separate section for this Becoming Catholic, Becoming a Better Catholic section with the syllabus, the videos, talks, links, readings, all of that stuff. But it would be great to have the Wednesday hall packed every Wednesday. So there's folks who are not at the 1030 Mass, who are not going to be at the 5 o'clock Mass tonight, who didn't hear me preach this. Please tell them. Please tell them. All right? Jesus wants his world back, and it's got to start with us. Amen.